Welcome, welcome, welcome to another You Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast, a bi week version of Sooners Under the Visor Sooners podcast, excuse me, powered by Jana King. Parker, take it away. Yes, Jana King, folks, they are the greatest team to ever clean and a proud partner of OU Athletics. They can deliver spotless results from stadiums to any size business across the country. So check them out at janaking.com for unbeatable commercial cleaning services. Very thankful to Jana King for their sponsorship of the Under the Visor podcast. We took a little bit of a break. This is the first mm-hmm. podcast in a week uh, since that late, late, late night podcast that Brian Clinton and I did from Oak Grove, Missouri in the aftermath mm-hmm of the Sooners loss to Eli Drinkwitz and company. You know, we try to relax a little bit. It's a shame what happened to them today. Shame. (laughs) As as some of you may notice, uh, if you're watching on the YouTube side, I'm in a new home studio, and that's because I got moving done over the bye week. That was my primary objective. So here we are. Uh, Nice thing is this new setup means I have a monitor right here so I can glance over and keep an eye on the Tennessee Georgia game, which is happening as we're recording this podcast. It will be long over by the time uh, it hits distribution platforms. But yeah, that's uh, that's where we're at, Brandon. Not a whole lot happening in terms of on field developments. Naturally, yes, the team is preparing for Alabama coming up this Saturday, but The main focus right now, quite understandably, is the Sooners' search for a new offensive coordinator. That is uh, 100% correct. I was was going to lead in with, yeah, I mean, there's this thing going on that people seem to be really interested in, and that is the offensive coordinator job. I... It is getting interesting though, behind the scenes, like it's getting interesting. I I wouldn't, I wouldn't label things as interviews. I would label things like contact has been made with a certain number of player of coaches, excuse me. Um, And we'll discuss some of those names on this podcast naturally. Uh, But let's, not even bury the lead here because the name Dan Mullen is it's and he's already it's funny because he's putting out very vague I would rather be a head coach type deal which we all understand that's what he would rather do you went over a hundred games between Mississippi State and Florida in your 10 year career as a head coach, you're going to want to naturally jump back into the head coaching, you know, and, and that would be like you and I getting out of what we're doing now and then going and working for somebody else and being their kind of assistant instead of running the business. Um, it just, yeah, and- it just, well, and it certainly doesn't work sometimes. But... Well, yeah, it it, it kind of depends on how you're wired, right? Yeah. Because, you know, for instance, there there are certain people who get a taste of being the boss and then decide, you know what, this is too much, or this just isn't me. I would rather know exactly what I need to do, uh, have a queue of directives that is communicated to me from yep. a an authority figure and just be able to execute those like I know I'm capable of. And then there are others who get that taste of being the boss and get addicted. They're in love with it. They're like, yes, this is where I belong. This is the role that's fit for me. And so all of a sudden that role gets taken away from you as it did from Dan Mullen at Florida back in 2021. Uh, it can be more difficult for folks that are wired that way yeah. to come back and accept a role working under someone else. But I think as far as this Oklahoma vacancy is concerned, Brandon, the reality for a guy like Dan Mullen, the That's reality the for job. whoever the hire is, is this offensive coordinator is going to be given a lot of control over his own operation because that's kind of the way it has to be at this point for Oklahoma. The Sooners have to be willing to let whoever their next OC may be just go full throttle. 
do whatever they feel like they need to do to put OU in the best position to return to playing prolific offense in 2025. And one of the interesting conversations uh, that a few members have been having over on the OUinsider.com VIP board as we've been discussing the potential hire Dan Mullen is why, why on earth would you hire a guy if there's a good chance he's only there for one year? And the response to that, my response to that, Brandon, is because 2025 is what it's about. Like 2025 yeah. is going to dictate whether Brent Venables and any of his assistants have a job beyond 2025. Right now, it has to be understood and you have to approach it as though you're on a one year contract. If you don't right. win in 2025, you're cooked. So this hire has to be made with the expectation and the belief that your next OC can turn things around immediately. And if he's only there a year, that's fine. Because if you stabilize things in 2025, that's really all that matters. That way you guarantee yourself some additional leeway, and then you can figure things out in a bit more of a long-term capacity, but you shouldn't be planning for the long-term right now because the long-term isn't guaranteed. No. Uh, I, and I guess I find it, look, I think Oklahoma has the money to buy out the uh, buy out BV's contract right now. If they if they wanted to. Oh yeah. Oh, they yeah. could do it. They could do whatever they, they want. Here's here's the reality of the situation for you fans that don't understand this, you're like, "Oh, well, BV should be gone, blah blah blah." Well, for one, it's out there. Everybody's been talking about it. There's stuff going on that you just don't do that. Right? Like there's there's a humanity aspect to it. That's number one. Number two, um Man, the donors love BV. They do. They everybody love, loves BV. Everybody I, loves BV. It's it's weird. He is. He's one of those guys that's just like you gravitate towards him. He's a nice guy. He generally cares for people, and that's the 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 wild part about the whole situation. Um, so you're gonna see the donors do a lot of things that they've been kind of on their hands about. Over the last few years, they've gotten better with the whole NIL situation, right? But I think you're going to see them as far as and they and they've done it on the defensive side of the ball. They have not been on their hands. They've been throwing money around, making sure that they get the best of the best when it comes to the defensive staff. And I'm not saying that's not how it has been on the offense as far as like best of the best. I think when you lose a leader as strong and as measured and as progressive as a Jeff Levy and in turn Lincoln Riley, like they, they lost two OCs, this staff, this offensive staff lost two OCs in a matter of three years. Right. And you can probably count Kel Gundy in there. So three, because he was a major piece of the Riley and the Levy deal as far as play calling, as far as, uh, doing the, uh, the prep for the game and all well, that. He, he and Levy would never have had any overlap except that off season. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I'm, I'm just game. saying like, as far as like just their, the, the, the actual assistance and how much they've been around him. So when you, when you, when that happens, when that happens, the unfortunate part is that sometimes things just kind of fall off the rails. Like they just, they just do. Um, when turnover and turnover and turnover keep, continues to happen. So I think this will be good to get another person in there that's very boisterous, that's very in control, that is strictly about the offense, knows how to develop quarterbacks, and can get things done. And every name that's out there right now, Parker, is a quarterback guru for all yep. intents and purposes. So... That's what you're going to see, and that's where BV is going to lean there. And I think and that's, that's kind of how it has to be, has Brandon. To be. In many ways, like that—that that is the most important thing. Is your quarterbacks have to be have to be developed because, and this is an entirely different conversation. It's one that has been, or I'm a, a conversation. It's that really not entirely different. It goes hand in hand. Well, it, it it does go hand in hand, but I, you know that's that's the nature of this whole deal yeah. is what, what we just uh, referenced is that if you're hiring an offensive coordinator 
for 2025, one of the main criteria, maybe not the main criterion, but one of the main criteria is this guy has to be a solid developer of quarterbacks yep. because the guys you have on the roster right now, most specifically Jackson Arnold and Michael Hawkins have been done a disservice this year. Yep. They have not been developed properly. They have struggled but those struggles are not all on their shoulders. That is not to completely absolve them of responsibility, but they have not been coached. They have not been developed. They have not been molded the way that quarterbacks should be coached and developed and molded at a place yeah. like the University of Oklahoma. And I don't think they're both coming back next year, as we've discussed. I think it's going to be one or the other, which one we'll see, but you would expect that the Sooners are going to be in play for a transfer portal quarterback, a veteran with some experience, and mm -hmm. that heading into 2025, they will not hand the starting job to anybody prematurely because that that got him into trouble, as we saw mm -hmm. this past offseason. So I would expect that there, be, there will be a genuine, legitimate quarterback competition in which ultimately at the end of fall camp, the best man wins. But the hope would be that you get to the end of August and you have multiple guys that you can be confident in as starting options because they have steadily progressed and yeah. been developed over the course of an off season. Yeah. And I, you, you look at the names and like we talked about Dan Mullen, he's a polarizing figure within the OU fan base in general within college football. He hasn't, and like I was saying earlier, he hasn't coached in two seasons. And so I guess this would be the third season, right? That he hasn't coached, correct? 22, 23. Yeah. This is the third season this that be he's been on season. the sideline. So, yes. So I almost think it's unrealistic for him to just – the type of job that he wants as a head coach, this isn't going to happen. Like, it's not. And it so may. It may. Uh, it may, but I mean, like – North Carolina is one to watch. I guess that makes sense. That kind of makes sense to me just because of the um the success that they had under Fedora for a little bit. Um so it does kind of I guess it does kind of make sense in that aspect. Uh somebody with a strong, strong offensive mind. Um how is Mac Brown he's one hundred percent retiring after this this well, season? Well it's not hundred like nothing is hundred percent, but like there is some and it, this has been mentioned to me by numerous sources at this point that yeah. there is some genuine concern that Mac Brown might be on the verge of stepping down in North Carolina, that this might be his last season and that were he to do so, there would be a lot of mutual interest between Dan Mullen and North Carolina. Again, all hypothetical hmm. at this point because Mac yeah. has to step down first before that even becomes a conversation worth having between UNC and Mullen. But it kind of goes without saying, Brandon, a guy like that would sooner be a head coach at the power four level than an offensive coordinator. So if Dan Mullen gets a power four head coaching opportunity this offseason, you would have to imagine he is going to jump on it before yeah. taking an OC role. And at 73 years old, you just don't want a Joe Paul situation where he's got to go, he's got to go type deal. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> he took off from it. <laughs> there were some extenuating circumstances there. There there was, I guess. Yeah. I just, well, no, well, that wasn't known at the time. But yeah. Um, I Again, polarizing figure. But there's a lot of people that also sit around and say, well, he's, his offense is, it's, philosophy has been passed by and what like uh, let, let's let's go back to 2021 they were putting up point they literally won a game 70 to 52 they they it's not like they weren't putting up points against teams their defense was atrocious it was bad i can't remember was it um uh, who was there? it starts with a g um who was their DC at the time? Oh, Grantham. Grantham. And Grantham. Oh yeah, they hated didn't that Napier, guy. Didn't Napier keep him on on staff? Uh, that did start? not last very long. It did guys. not. But that's my point. Is like he was the problem. It wasn't that they didn't have talent. It was everybody had. There's this recruiting notion. Look, yes, he's an OC. His job is going to be 
to recruit the quarterback and to just be there to say, look at my philosophy when they go over film and all that. That's generally what he's going to do. You will have hypothetically some of the best recruiters on offense in college football, like Emmett Jones. And yes, I'm going to say Bill Biedenboe. Go look at his last three classes, guys. He's done a fantastic job recruiting. Um, you can go, you can date back to 2020, or excuse me, you can go to 2022. But that was really his only like big like in 21, I guess. Well, those it's, two it's classes, really it's just 21, 22. And honestly, like yeah, those are it. Well, and this is this is what like this whole argument. But that's what's hurt this team. Just though. does not make sense because in 2021 he had a directive from Lincoln Riley. Right, we're going light. You're only taking two. And they took two in 2022. They ended up with two because you had the extenuating circumstance COVID. of a staff shakeup, not yeah. COVID, but a staff shakeup Lincoln Riley leaving for USC and the new staff coming in and they wound up with two offensive linemen. Oh, that's was that's what it right. was. That's right. But these last three classes, man, have been killer. 23 yes, was awesome. Amazing. 24 mm -hmm. was fantastic. 25 might be the best of them all. With Michael yep. Fasusi and Ryan Foje. Exactly. So, again, you're going to have that. Uh, granted, I, I and I, I don't like saying this, but the odds that you don't need a tight end coach is going to be pretty slim because, and, it, and I, I, I'm going to also say this, I think Joe John wants to call plays at this point now. Like, yeah. I think he's got a taste Which is of understandable. It. He's paid and that's where he's, Yeah, he's paid his dues. He's not a bad play caller. There's, there's things have been open. I'm just going to say that. Like mm -hmm. if, 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 if things could be hit by the quarterback, like in not knocking the kids, they're struggling a little bit, but man, the points will be put up on the board. Let's just put it that way. Um, so he hasn't really been that bad at it. He's actually been somewhat decent at calling the calling plays and, and prepping and scheming and all that type of stuff. Um, so you're probably going to need a tight end coach and I'll wager a bet that Parker and I actually talked about it. I bet you their first call isn't too far away from Norman, Oklahoma for a tight end coach. I, I, you heard it here first. Morgan Turner is going to be, and that's who I would call would be Morgan Turner from Arkansas, because guess what? Who's there? Who's, I'm, who's assume, I'm assuming you're referring to Luke has. I'm referring to Luke has who was committed to Oklahoma at one point. So mm -hmm. um, there's again, you could have that potentially happening um, and the rest of the staff kind of stay the same. So um, I, look, it could happen. I, I like you, I've heard that is number one on the list of if you perfect world, Dan Mullen would be the pick. Now, does that mean he's going to be the offensive coordinator or that we're predicting he's going to be the offensive? No, absolutely not. Far from that, actually. Uh, it is, but the, the, the talk, yes. He said that he doesn't want to be, or he didn't say he didn't want to be, because let me rephrase that. He said, if they're asking for me to be a head coach, I'm listening, that type of stuff. Because that generally, again, like we talked about, that's what he wants to do first. But if push comes to shove and Oklahoma goes, you know what? We're going to give you two and a half, three million dollars. <laughs> He's going to take it. Oh, yeah. You you would be a fool not to at that He's point. Because And this is another thing that I mentioned on the board last night at OUinsider.com, Brandon, is if you want to be a head coach again, and that opportunity does not immediately exist this coming off season, which the likelihood is that it won't because he's been out of the game for three years. Yep. If that opportunity does not exist, there may not be an opportunity that puts you on a faster track to being a head coach again than offensive coordinator at the University of Oklahoma because Bingo. you know that Brent Venables with the talent that Oklahoma should be bringing back on the defensive side of the ball in 2025. They're going to have that side of the ball squared away. That's yep. not going to be a concern. If you can get the offense right, if you can fix this, 
if you can rejuvenate that unit and get Oklahoma back to playing above average offense, you don't have to have a top 10 offense in the country. If you have a top 25 offense in the country, odds are Oklahoma wins double digit games. They're in the hunt for the college football playoff. And your stock is once again, sky yes. high. You have situated yourself on the front row of the coaching carousel for any and all major power four vacancies that come available. Yeah. So if it's Dan Mullen, Brandon, and I feel confident saying this, if it's Dan Mullen, I think any way you slice it, it is a one year gig because either he is a head coach or about to be a head coach by this time next year, or it crashes and burns and everybody's fired, right? Like that, that's kind of the two ways this can go. Yeah. Well, hmm. the buyout isn't going to be that much cheaper to even after next year for BB. So, I mean, I, I guess if they're, what if they're That's, showing pro, I, I guess here's, here's my deal. What if they're seven and five, eight and four next year, that schedule doesn't get any, any easier, by the way. Um, is he, is he, is he gone? That's uncomfortable territory to be in. It is uncomfortable. That's why I asked the question because that's like fringe right there. That's like right on that cusp of <laughs> that's like you can teeter half, either way. Yeah, right? that's like half the fan base is going to insist that you're fired and the other half is going to relentlessly defend you and yeah. say, no, like this is progress. This is headed in the right direction. It's going to keep heading in the right direction. Yep. Oh, gosh, yeah, that's not a place you want to be. You don't want to win eight games next year. That puts you in no man's land. And it what does. do you do at that point? It does. Uh, I mean, my gut says they keep him because... The future becomes about vibes at that point. It does. What are the but... vibes? Are the vibes it... good going into 2026? Or are the vibes... <laughs> eh. I mean, depends on what the recruiting class looks like as well. So, um, And that's going to be the other thing that's going to be tough for BV next year. Is I don't like as well as they've recruited. Can you? It's not going to be as easy of a sell. I think the, his saving grace, and he would be crazy to do anything different. I think no matter who he hires as OC, he has to look them square in the eye and say, You don't touch Jaden O'Neill, and you better make him your top priority and keep him. Because if you can hold on to him, you're going to get dudes to come and play for you. Yeah, well, and I I don't think any offensive coordinator worth his salt is going to need to be told to go keep Jaden. Well, I don't know. Some guys <laughs> have mean, their guy. So you look at the uh you look at the agenda when you show up, you see, oh, top one hundred quarterback in twenty twenty six class committed, keep him. Yeah, that'll be a boxy check. Relationship Quickly is set to begin now do, 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 do. <laughs> making the call. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, another name that look, we've been our buckle and, and look, I get it. Washington state isn't exactly playing the toughest schedule in the world, but I I, I hate that argument, Brandon. I do too, I, but because yeah, that's no, what no. fans say is like, have you seen? Oh, who no, yeah, playing? no, I hear you. I know you're not oh, making oh. that argument, but like, no, I'm not. I hate that argument. Like when when anybody goes, well, who have they beat? My immediate rejoinder is, well, who have they lost to? Yeah, because like for instance, everybody's saying that about Indiana, right? Who have they beat? Well, who have they lost to? Nobody. They're ten and zero. Yep. Washington State. Who have they lost to? I'll tell you who they've lost to. Boise State, yep. who's probably going to the college football playoff. Right. Yeah. So that is the only scar on the Cougars season. That is their it, one loss to this point. Correct. And my point is, is who cares? Because if it's not going to be Dan Mullen, the other perfect scenario is a two for one with OC bringing their quarterback. Matier's pretty good. And yeah. I was talking to somebody today. I literally had the or yesterday and I got kind of in like a, a debate with him because I wanted to hear the reaction Parker. And I said, mm -hmm. well, is he good enough to play in the sec? 
And this person goes, what does that even mean? <laughs> like, and I was, I was trying to get their reaction out of them and it worked. And they're like, well, Cam is killing it. And I said, yeah, that's in the ACC. That's not the SEC. He goes, but if you're good, you're good. Dylan Gabriel came from UCF and was really good in the big 12. He went from Oklahoma and is arguably up one or two for the Heisman, depending on if you like Travis Hunter or Dylan Gabriel at this point. Um, so the point is, if you're good, you're good. And if you've got good players around you and you know the system and you're smart, you can play at any level. And, Josh and you Heupel. A, yeah, you know who's a great example of this? Dylan Gabriel. Yeah, Josh like, Heupel, Dylan Gabriel. Yeah, again, perfect example. Having watched Dylan Gabriel for two full seasons at Oklahoma, there were plenty of fans that came to the conclusion pretty early on. And, you know, some of them came to the conclusion – later on down the road, but many of them ultimately arrived at the conclusion mm-hmm. that Dylan Gabriel doesn't play sexy enough football. Yeah. And at this point, Brandon, I'm fairly certain there's a significant contingent of the Oklahoma fan base that would sacrifice a limb to get Dylan Gabriel back at the quarterback position, because ultimately <laughs> I think what this year has hammered home is that it does not matter what it looks like. It does not matter what it feels like. What you want is a guy at QB Who's yeah. not going to turn the ball over? Who's going to make smart decisions with the football? Who's going to be able to orchestrate scoring drives? And who's a winner? And that's what Dylan mm-hmm. Gabriel is a winner. And I see a lot of those same traits in John Matier. And I really don't think you have to overthink this because he's from Little Elm, Texas, Brandon. No, two and a half hours south of Norman. If his offensive coordinator is employed at the University of Oklahoma, how in the world is John Matier not going to follow him to the university? It makes so much sense. And again, those to me, those are the, your top one A, one B, or two. Doesn't matter how you look at it. That's how I would look at it as well. If I'm Brent Venables, and then from that point on, you've got some really good selections. I, I look, Joe Craig's probably going to Florida State. Um, that would be my be guess. Vibe. Yes, seems to be the vibe right now. Now. I'm not saying he's not going to be a, for you, Joe Craddock fans, because you saw Tulane kill it today. I'm not trying to pee in your Cheerios or anything like that. Like there's still a chance that he becomes the the OC at Oklahoma because he has what Oklahoma needs, and that's a quarterback that can ball in Mensa. Um, so um, I, I I just. Not throwing that out there. The, the other names that, and I think they're interesting because somebody asked me on Twitter today, like, would GJ Kinney, did he, would he actually leave Texas State head coach to BOU's OC? And why would he not? Because why would he not? Well, I, I okay, pay, okay, no, the okay, pay is so better. Let, at Oklahoma. Correct. There you go. Then, you're betting on yourself because what is what, the best you're going to get going from Texas State is maybe like Baylor. Yeah. Like well, a jump. It, it, OC at Oklahoma, you can get a you can get a strong P4 head coaching job. With his experience at Texas State. So there's a resume there. Mm-hmm. And you bet on yourself. I think that's the biggest thing, like betting on yourself and and but you also put yourself in line if 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 it works out long term and let's say he doesn't get a head coaching job that he really really loves and yeah, he's well, at Oklahoma it, for five six seven ten years and BB goes you know what I'm done with all this I'm retiring you put yourself if you're successful in line to be the next head coach at the University of Oklahoma. Well, and Texas State is one of those programs which it's just tough to build something. Brandon. It is. It looked for half a second like Jake Spavital, whose name has also been mentioned for the vacancy, yep. was building something at Texas State. And he just never could make it catch, never could make it stick. And Jake Spavital, Jake Spavital is a fine football coach. He has helped orchestrate a impressive turnaround at Baylor. They started out two and four. They're now six and four. They've got a clear path to eight and four. Mm-hmm. But Jake Spavital couldn't hack it at Texas State. G.J. Kenny has had a little more success to this point than Spavital did, but even so, you're in San Marcos, Texas, right? It's yep. tough. 
it's tough to recruit there. It's tough to win there. And there's going to, it feels like that's the type of place where there's always going to be a glass ceiling where yep. even if you get to doing a really, really good job, you know, what are you realistically expecting at Texas state eight, nine wins on an annual basis mm -hmm. Man, the G five just beats itself up. You know, the G five cannibalizes itself. There's so much parody in the G five. And there's no better example than just a couple of weeks ago when Kennesaw State, who I think was one of two winless teams in the FBS at that point, went on the road, mind you, and mm -hmm. knocked off undefeated Liberty as a 27-point dog or something. Ah, yep. Like I mean, that's G5 football for you. Yep. If you're on the G5 level, especially these days, it is really, really tough to, six, uh, to sustain success at the top level. You can... You can have a bowl team every year, but who who aspires to be a G5 head coach that's going to bowl games every year? No, a guy like G.J. Kinney, a, any guy that is a competitor and that has a desire to leave his mark on the game and create a legacy, no, man, they, they want to be coaching at the, the big boy programs. They want to be coaching at the Blue Bloods. They want to be coaching at the programs that are going to be competing for national titles year in and year out. Yep. And, and the unfortunate part with GJ Kenny is in that look, like we said, the perfect scenario, right? The perfect scenario of it's either Dan Mullen or somebody that's a two for one. The issue with him is that McLeod, he's done after this year. So he can't go with it. It's a good quarterback, but he can't come with you. And I don't know that that's somebody that be able to go. Oh, come on! I want to. Who are you talking about here? Texas State quarterback. Oh, Texas State's quarterback. That's right. Yes, yeah. yes. No, no. Right. We, I, you're you're thinking I was talking about Baylor and Storyer Roberts. No. Um, which we can in Spavital because he's only a junior. So again, Spavital has the two for one, and he's an Oklahoman. On top of that, that is true. So he's going to one hundred percent know the state and his resume is, is he's 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 spread out enough he knows the state of texas almost better than anybody um i don't see why that wouldn't be a perfect fit as well i i actually tweeted today spavital spavital is intriguing me more and more and more as this goes on i might throw him three on my list at this juncture well, as oddly as it sounds, I guess, I guess the holdup for me on Spavital would be, he's been a good coach for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Has he ever been? Has he ever done anything spectacular? Because you know, like Ben Arbuckle is a great example of a guy that kind of gives off vibes of the next Lincoln Riley type of dude, right? It kind of does, and, yeah. Looking past the obvious West Texas similarity there. Mm -hmm. You know, runs that uh, new school style of offense, uh, has had success at the G5 level with it, and now is starting to – well, I don't even know if you can consider Washington – like, what is the Pac-2 right now? It's not really G5. It's not really P4. It's like caught in the twilight zone. But uh, Ben Arbuckle feels like a guy that at 29 years old is on the verge of hitting it big in the coaching profession. Dan Mullen. Yeah. You know he's who the longest resume of any of the candidates. Heck, he's probably got a longer resume than all the other candidates combined. Jake oh, Spavital yeah. has a resume of modest length, and it is mm -hmm. modestly impressive, but I don't think it just like screams at you. I mean, you know? he coached he coached uh Kyler Murray, uh Kyle Allen, um obviously he was a QB coach with uh, Johnny Football um, his last year. And he also coached Geno Smith. He was a quarterback coach for Geno Smith at West Virginia. Uh, Brandon Whedon. So, like, he's got, like, as far as QB development, he checks that box off tenfold. I mean, there's no argument there, right? I mean, look look at Sawyer, right? Sawyer Robertson's killing it. So I, I, 
he checks that box, right? It's just the play calling, I think, the the scheming. I think that's that's going to be your biggest issue. He's doing really well in the Big 12, but the Big 12 isn't the SEC as we are seeing. Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> like, and let me be clear. If you're hiring just for a quarterback's coach, like if that's, oh, he's if that's the role you're hiring for, like, oh, yeah, Spavadal's top of the list candidate. But yep. he's got to be offensive coordinator and quarterback's coach in this scenario. And the offensive coordinator aspect of things is where I'm a little less bullish on Spavital than Mullen and Arbuckle. I still like him at three for me. I still like him at three. I, I like that guy. Joe Craddock's there. Um, I love GJ. If GJ Kenny could just have a quarterback come with him, that would just be a no brainer for me. And I mean, kind of the quiet, you know, I'll say this. So I was talking to somebody today. And when they said Dan Mullen is far from done, it's the interest is there. Yep. It's strong. But they said to me, oh, I said, well, why do you think it's far from done uh, with everything? He goes, well, he could take a head coaching job and, BV still going through film on all the top offenses in college football right now. Just kind of like he is bound and determined to make this pick correct. Like, and he's like we said, he's got donor support. And it's not just donor support for this. I think people need to understand that donor support within NIL is oddly at like an all time hot this juncture because they are tired of getting their kicked in. Well, and not only that simple math, right? Does it make more sense to unload an extra $10 million for correct NIL purposes this off season? Or does it make more sense to spend a hundred million dollars overhauling an entire football coaching staff correct. next off season? Because that's the risk you run. If you don't take NIL seriously and you don't level your game up, in terms of talent acquisition, specifically via the transfer portal between the months of December and May. And Oklahoma hasn't been bad. I think they're like 12th, 11th, 12th, as far as most expensive roster in college football right now, which is, I mean, that just ought to make everybody's gut just Yeah, hurt. That's, a, a good boy. That's, a, that's a tough pill to swallow when you're you're paying that much money and getting that much production out of it. And that's where the fans are going to say, look, they're not developing players. Well, defensively, they sure as hell are. But I'm not going to sit here and say they're not developing them on offense. I just think when quarterback play is not up to snuff, everything looks bad. Because that's the one person that touched the outside the center that touches the ball every single play and everything goes through them. So it's now, can you say they're not developing quarterback? I, I'll get on board with that. Yep. I'll get on board with that. Cause I think that's true. Think, and therein well, lies your five and five record. Yeah. And you know, and I, I'll reiterate this. The reviews on Kevin Johns have been very strong. Very I think strong. that's a guy that you try to keep around. Yep. See if he wants to flex back to his original analyst role. See if you can find some creative ways to make him more incorporated than your traditional analyst in 2025 and beyond. But also got to acknowledge the possibility that like Matt Wells, the analyst role, though, you might be a stopover for him prior to his next OC gig. Because I, because I do know he was very, very close to getting at least one P4 offensive coordinator gig this past off season. And when he didn't get it, it became okay. Analyst at Oklahoma for now. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of Colin Klein as an option? I I don't think A and M would let that happen. You don't? No. So this is what I threw out to the source I was talking because they said what you said, and I agree with them. But I said, what if who both BV and Colin Klein look towards look to as kind of their mentor, like mentors of all mentors.
It was easy. It's Bill Schneider. Yeah, Bill Schneider. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't realize you were seriously the, asking. I, I thought that yeah, was a I was seriously asking. question that you, that you were I know it was rhetorical answer. for you and me, but I wanted you to answer it because for the audience purposes. Yeah, Thanks Bill for Snyder. not playing along. Um, <laughs> so, uh, all right. So let's hypothetically say BV calls Bill Snyder and says, can you please talk with Con Klein and tell him to come work, you know, and, and, and knowing Bill Snyder and just his loyalty with Brent Venables and how much he loves Brent Venables and all that type of stuff. He calls and he says, Colin, look, K state guys stick together, you know, blah, blah, blah. This might, I think this will be better for you. You could possibly be even the head coach there once Brent retires, like that could be your thing, or you could jump, and take a head coaching job. Either way, it's not going to hurt you. The talent's there, all that type of stuff, right? So basically, Bill Snyder in this scenario is the godfather on OU's behalf. He's the he's godfather on BV's, Colin Klein. He's the godfather on BV's behalf. So the source told me, he's like, in that scenario, maybe it takes place. Because that does happen sometimes when they call to get advice from the mentors on what they should do and whatnot. But the odds of it happening, correct, are very, very small, almost zero. That said, I don't know. I I still think he would be a hell of a hire. I think he would be a hell of a hire. I think what he's doing at Texas A&M, dude, Connor Wegman looked like, I mean, he looked like Jackson Arnold last year. I mean, we're just going to be honest. He didn't look great. No. And... And it's not and just Wegman he, that has played good football at AM for I, that's what I was about to get. And then the, the both it's quarterbacks. And Marcel Reed. Marcel Reed is killing it. Like both of them have been good this year. It hasn't it, that's development, dude. That is development. That's what it's that's what OU fans are used to as far as quarterback. Stick anybody in there, they're gonna be good at quarterback. Didn't matter. And now it's that's it's nobody it feels like stick anybody in there at quarterback and they're going to be bad. You're going to get a turnover. <laughs> yeah. Like it's just, which is not how it should be. Yeah. But that's why I just think if you could make it happen, I mean, if, if you're Brent Venables, you at least have to call and ask, right? I mean, yeah. Do your due diligence. Yeah, exactly. Else. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the top offenses in college football right now. Um, trying to, Get the rankings here. Um, as far as teams, well, I'll tell you, go. Miami stands above the rest. They do. It's, it's Miami and that. Indiana. Miami and Indiana are the top two offenses. In and everybody wants Mike Shanahan, but I just if you're gonna go that route, you're gonna have to get you're gonna have to somehow be able to take talk like a Jake Spavital or even a Kevin Johns to stick around, and you know help out in that aspect because you've got to get you now you've got to go get an elite quarterback coach and and i guess shanahan could coach tight ends he could but hey indiana ponied up for kurt signetti today they did boy you think they don't understand how fortunate a hand they've been dealt out of nowhere Playing at that guy, like they, they trust me, they are going to do whatever it takes to make sure he and as much of his staff as possible stay in Bloomington for the long haul. And as we saw, they are willing to pay the type of money that you would not expect Indiana to be able slash willing to pay to a head football coach because they've never been any good at football. Now they're better than they've ever been, and they're taking it seriously. Good on them. Obviously, I don't think a guy like Mike Shanahan, if his star continues to rise, is long before Bloomington, Indiana, but it's very possible he could return in 2025. It's very possible Signetti could keep that entire staff intact. For what about year. Casey Woods at SMU? You want to know what, in what is interesting about him? What's that? He's offensive coordinator slash tight ends coach. Hmm. Which means again, you would have to go hire you know, see. And we all know that Rhett Lashley calls the plays there, but I'm just kind of throwing that out there because SMU is up there as well as far as 
uh, college football rankings. I mean, you're going to go dip back into Jacksonville state, <laughs> take their OC too. <laughs> They've got a good offense. Well, they have a great offense. Yes. Got a good offense. Uh, uh, who's Boise state's OC? Dirk Cutter. Oh, wow. You want that, no I part remember... of that. Trust me. You want no part of that. No, you don't. And I remember, <laughs> I remember he's, we talked about, I forgot that he was, that was the guy. I he forgot was the Bucks head coach for three years. Yeah. Boy. And do I, do I remember them? Well, unfortunately, Dirk Cutter is one of those guys where like you look at Boise state's offensive output and on paper, it's like, wow, whoever their offensive coordinator is, he must be a bad dude. And then you yeah. remember, Oh no, wait, he has Ashton Genty. That's why it looks like he's good at his job. Yep. And then obviously people keep tweeting about Will Stein. I think people needed to realize that that's, Probably not happening. Yeah, like the shot. odds are not good. Long shot. Long shot. Um, again, Eric Morris, North Texas, bro. That'd be that'd be awesome, man. That would be an awesome hire because Eric coach. Morris. Yep. Yeah, that's a that's another guy that fits the uh, Lincoln Riley template, if yep. you will. Young QB whisperer. In the G5 ranks right now, but won't be for long. Eric Morris is going places. Yeah, and I'm trying to f remember who they're... Is Chandler Morris their starting quarterback? At North Texas? Yes. Yes. Oh, bro. That would be... That would be the ultimate hilarity. Because <laughs> doesn't he have one more year? I, I think he does have one more year. <laughs> Sixth year senior uh, Chandler Morris. Just back in Oklahoma. For hilarity, I want that to happen. I want that to happen just for the hilarity of it. And not like a hilarity of in as of like ha 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 that guy stunk. The hilarity of it because he wasn't bad. He leaves and rejuvenates his whole career at North Texas. And is freaking good. Yeah. I remember seeing that the other day and I was like, dude, like he's balling out. And you're going to have people when we brought up North Texas, no, we don't want another North Texas offense corner. We don't want another North Texas head coach. Um, I challenge everybody. People on OU Insider have already had this. We've already, I've already went through it and did this for them. Go look at Eric Morris's career as an offensive coordinator. It's just, holy crap! It's prejudice and nothing more. And I I understand it's insanely that there's awesome a stigma now. I understand that there's a stigma with North Texas yep. because of South Latrell, but j just because Eric Morris happens to coach at North Texas right now does not mean he is the next Seth Latrell. That is lazy rhetoric. Where was Eric Morris before he was at North Texas? Washington Georgia? State. Hmm. And what what's the other top guy on OU's list? Where's he from? Washington State. I rest my case. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and I, both of them have had a hand in the development of one Cam Ward. That is very true. And John Matier. Mm -hmm. I mean, can't beat that. I, I look. I, I so basically, like, I guess what I'm saying is. There hasn't been a whole lot of credible buzz yet on yeah. Morris in Oklahoma. Really hasn't, no. Morris absolutely makes no less sense than Ben Arbuckle. You could get him for $3 million because North Texas isn't going to pay that much money for a head coach and because they don't have to. They're going to get the top North Texas talent that isn't going to go to SMU, TCU, Oklahoma, Texas, and a couple of the other – P4 programs. They're going to get all the top G5 kids. They're going to North Texas. Um, the facilities are awesome. It's right in DFW area. Like it, it's perfect. And you're going to get some of the top Oklahoma kids. Like it is one of the best position G5 programs there is in all of college football. And so, I mean, it, it would be, he's already given up 
being a head coach one time to go coach. He bet on himself, went from Incarnate Ward, and yep. he brought Cam Ward with him from Incarnate Ward um, to Washington State, obviously. And, and here's the funny thing about it. You want to, you all, oh, you think you want to hear something crazy and just kick yourself, be pissed off about it. All Oklahoma had to do last year was go get Ben Arbuckle, who was still dominating as an offensive coordinator with Cam Ward as a quarterback. And you want to know who OU's quarterback would have been this year? Cam Ward. Cam Ward. Well, that's all you had to do. Maybe. Yeah, I, you know, yeah, I, I, well, I actually in, don't in think theory, so. My, Miami would have thrown a ridiculous life wall bag at him. And OU at that point in time would not have been willing to match it. No, now they're like, how much do you need? Yeah. These these days, <laughs> yes. These days, yes. If that, if that were the predicament that we were discussing going into this coming off season, boy, Oklahoma would make sure they win that I, NIL battle. The best analogy I can make for this whole situation that you all are going to watch unfold this off season is y'all remember the Dominique Williams situation where Oklahoma flat out threw the most money out? Yep. Because they needed a defensive tackle to just put the cherry on top of the defense and it worked. You're going to see that across the board this off season, because you cannot afford as a program. And I'm going to a, a young power four coach told me this the other day, and this is why you can't afford to do it. I was talking to them and I said, you know, what if everything fell apart? Would you be interested in the Oklahoma jobs? Yes. This is a head coach, successful head coach. And that's about all I'm going to say from that point on. Or you know what it is. Uh, but this is, that's it. Um, but their exact words were, if this doesn't go well, it sets Oklahoma back another year and a half than it already has as far as recouping. Because that staff has to come in. You're going to have all the transfer out and they're going to have to hope that they hit home runs on every transfer and hold on to a class that is already being brought in on top of holding on to the previous class as well. And still try to grab all the top portal guys at the same time. And that is not an easy thing to do because most of the time, if you're Oklahoma, you're going to be with the new layout of the early national signing day being on December 4th and it being literally three days before the conference title games, top head coaches or top coaches in general or coaches just in general are not going to want to leave in the middle of their season and quit on their players. So you're screwed if you take a job now. That's why you don't see a lot of coaches. Have you noticed that? Like most coaches firing, you're going to say it's going to be like a summer spring thing now, I think. More so get mm -hmm. through the national signing day and then deal with it. Yeah, could be. I mean, I, I don't know how you can do it, man. And Because you can't imagine like, let's say James, just because there's a first thing that popped on the top of my head, James Franklin making a run and, you know, BB is gone and you got to, oh, I'm going to take the OU job. He's not going to quit on a 10 and two Penn state team. Right. Like in the middle. Of, and no, I don't think that's who they were. I was just, that was just the analogy. So it's just, it's a weird deal where they had the national, they're going to have to fix that. They got to fix that. That's just such a bad spot. Isn't it crazy how two weeks makes a huge difference? Because normally it's on like December 20th, 18th to the 20th, right? Mm -hmm. And now it's December 4th. Like that's Boy, a big difference. There's going to be a lot happening that first weekend. Or I'm sorry, that first week of December. It's going to be it's a crazy. Lot. So much. Um, let's talk Let's talk real quickly about how you feeling about next week in Oklahoma. Like you think it's still going to be, you still feel like, you still feel like they might get, blitzed or do you think they well, I, I don't have a ton of confidence i don't have a ton of confidence um, either i do think the confidence portrayed by the admin in venables i think could be a galvanizing 
deal much like it was with Florida it and could Napier. Be, but <laughs> that might only mean they lose by 20 instead of 30. Correct. That's kind of where my head's at as well, unfortunately. I think the defense is going to play well. I do. I think Mill Rose is going to get he's going to get there he's going to get his. Like that's just going to you know Ryan Williams is going to get his. It is what it is. But I think overall when you look back at it when this game's ended you're going to sit there and say the defense did all they could once again to keep Oklahoma in the game. But that's again that's a week out. So they're just they're going to have to execute on a level that they've simply not executed at all season because they're, they're Offensive, outgunned. Right? Yeah, well, all around. They're outgunned on both sides of the ball. Alabama's yeah. more talented. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Well, it is a bye week. Let's cut this thing short um, or shorter and get out of here, man. That is going to do it for this version of the OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast powered by Jana King. Again, if you're not a member of OU Insider, we're doing this. Email is OUinsider at rivals.com. If you are a military, active, active military, if you're active, please email us, OUinsider at rivals.com. We will send you a promo code to get OU Insider for a year for $11.95. If you're a college student, same thing, .edu, teacher, .edu, email us, please. Um, OU Insider at Rivals.com. It has to be from your .edu or your school account that we know it's true and real. Um, that way you can get it again for $11.95. You email us, we send you a promo code. We will get that done for you and you can sign up and get OU Insider again year for $11.95. Subscribe to this YouTube channel. We're dropping content almost every single day on here. This week was kind of a weird week. By week, everybody kind of took a step back after the long season, but mm -hmm. it's going to start happening again. Daily picks or daily videos, excuse me, every every day on here. Um, all OU related baseball, basketball, softball, recruiting, football, all of the above, right here. OU Insider, YouTube. Uh, go subscribe to OU Insider. Nine ninety five a month, nine nine ninety five for the whole year. We've dropped tons of information, like the stuff you heard on the. Offensive coordinator stuff. That's just a morsel of what's been talked about and everything on OU Insider VIP. We've got recruiting information galore. Um, constantly doing stuff for you guys over there, answering questions. You can talk to Parker and I, Jesse, Brian, uh, Zach, all of those guys, uh, Brody, you can, everybody. You got it. You go over there. We can talk to you guys. It's going to be great. All right. That's going to do it. For this version of the OU Insider and Advisor Sooners podcast, for Parker Thune that you can't see right now, my name is Brandon Drum. I'm going to have to get the Brandon. webcam issues figured out, man. I did not anticipate having this issue again <laughs> in the new home studio, but we will get to the bottom of it. All right. I'll see you guys later. Thank you all.